fantastic to be here and talking at this summer school. I never went to a summer school when I was a PhD student. Uh, so it's very exciting to finally be able to go to one uh, that I didn't organize either, which is very nice. Uh, so one of the things that we were told uh, as part when we were giving these talks is that we were supposed to introduce ourselves. So my name is Carl and I work in this department. And what more interesting thing is there about me? I'm reasonably tall, I got a scruffy beard, and also I got tan lights, right? So now some of you would have now known and thought that those were quite impressive tan lines and what that would mean. And that is that you would think that I am following a society, namely the keepers of the cog or the Veluminati, who sets the rules of cycling, right? And the seventh rule of cycling is that tan lines should be cultivated and kept razor sharp. Right? Under no circumstances should one be rolling up their sleeves or shorts in an effort to somehow diminish one's tan lines. Sleeveless jerseys are under no circumstances to be employed. So I'm going to continue talking a bit about bikes then. So this here is my favorite bike in the whole world. This is my dream. I have to stop being an academic and ask Subin for a job at Google if I would afford it. This is a Conaglo Master Extra Light, the last steel frame who won the Tour de France. See the straight top tube. There's no Japanese fishing gear called Shimano on it. It's all Campagnolo straight through. Beautiful Italian craftsmanship. So now if you're a cyclist and live in Cambridge, it's kind of pointless. What's the use of cycling in this city? It's utterly flat. So what's the point, right? But I didn't used to live in Cambridge. I used to live on the Southwest in this beautiful town called Bristol, where all the hills are. So now when you live in Bristol, you've got several different choices of riding. So you can go north and you can go into beautiful Wales. And then you can cycle to a place called Port Talbot. Port Talbot is a steel mill. So steel workers, burn a lot of calories, exactly like cyclists. So you go there, cafes will serve you sandwiches that are the size of a leg. Perfect, so it's a place I used to go to. You can also go south and you can come to Exmoor, which is a beautiful place, which has some of the steepest hills in the country. So there was one time I went down to Exmoor, to this place called Lynmouth, I think it's called. And I was standing on the beach and then I looked across the Bristol Channel. And then I saw this. It's a little bit too dark, but hopefully you'll see, you'll get the point. Don't worry about it. So I saw this, right? And I looked at it, I thought, hang on, what's over here? Well, that's actually the steel mill in Port Talbot. So I was a little bit confused, but I was kind of interested about this fact. So then over the about 100 miles cycling home, I was thinking about this continuously. And then I like to call myself a scientist. So then I started, when I got home, made a measurement, figured out the distance between those two things. And then I went to the app, which allows you to cal calculate stuff based on the Earth's curvature. And I figured out that the distance to the horizon, if I was three meters tall, standing at the beach would be 6.2 kilometers, which means that the hidden height would be 125.6. So now let's go back to the image. we we'll look at it. So that's what I did. Now there's a big chimney here. You can go to the website tallbuildings.org and figure out how tall this thing is. It's a lot shorter than 125.6 meters. So now I was confused, right? How could I come up with a model that actually explains this? There was something clearly wrong with my previous model. So I thought and thought, I applied Occam's razor, and I found the simplest explanation was clearly that the Earth is flat. Right? Great. So now I had a buildup of about five minutes of that story. And if you wouldn't have laughed, my talk would have been completely ruined. So thank you very much. So now let's talk about why you laughed, because that's the interesting thing, right? I provided you with a model that perfectly fit this data. The Earth is flat, because it's flat, I can see stuff, right? The end. It's a really simple explanation as well. Why did we laugh about it? Okay, so one argument would be 
then how do we select between different models? We've heard this a lot. Uh, would be this notion then of Occam's razor, right? So Occam's razor then, if you ask the flat earther, would say, well, duh, the earth is flat, therefore I can see the building. It's like that sounds like a very simple explanation, especially if compared to the spherical earth person, who would say something like, due to the temperature gradient between water and air, there is a dispersion of water molecules into the air proportional to the distance to the surface, effectively creating a lens allowing us to see around the bend of the Earth's curvature. <gasps> right? So in the notion that we talked about Occam's razor the whole time, you should pick, it will naturally pick the simplest explanation. I can make quite a few arguments that the first one is a lot simpler than this, right? Okay, dependent on your notion of simplicity, which is something that we'll talk a lot about. Okay, so you still laugh though, so we can't apply this. So maybe what you applied instead was that, well, we've seen sun rises and sunsets, and if you've ever talked to someone who believes in a flat earth, their model to explain that is really damn complicated. It's really interesting to see how they have these things moving around and lids that protect. It's all super interesting. This here, our spherical Earth model explains very well, right? So what can we say then if we want to generalize this concept? We'll first simplify it a little bit. And that was, we'll take it down to our classic curve fitting example. We basically have some data points that I've seen as Carl rightly said, we're never really interested in doing well on the data points that we've seen. They are just a proxy for doing well somewhere else, right? Now we have a set of competing explanations of this, and we need to somehow choose between them, right? So the way you chose by laughing was, I believe, that you added something to this, right? You didn't just look at the data that I provided you, you added something to it. And that, to me, is how I like to frame machine learning and what machine learning actually is. So I like to draw this Pareto front. This is why I think the Pareto front of machine learning is. So what you have on this graph is that you have a specific task that you're about to solve. You can solve this task in many different ways. So what you need to get up to is this front, right? Now, you have two things that you can combine. You have the observations of the world, which is your data, and you have the knowledge, the stuff that you add to the data. Now, the certain problems, which are out here, right? Now I have all the data I'm ever going to see ever, right? Now, this is the machine learning problem. It's a lookup table, right? Cool. Then you have this end here, all the way on top. Now, you have something where you have the notion of truth. You have perfect knowledge about something. You know the function and you're just trying to predict the value. That's no machine learning either. Machine learning is the thing where I neither have enough data nor enough knowledge to solve the problem. So it's the thing that sits on somewhere on this front, right? And now what we've seen in terms of development of machine learning, before the internet, we were very much stuck somewhere here so we need to work damn hard to develop more and more complicated models so that we could use the knowledge that we had about the world, right, to solve stuff. Now, this thing has been moving very, very quickly so that actually we can do a lot more with a lot less knowledge, right? That has issues, which we'll talk about later, right? The important thing is, is that you keep these two components when you take the narrative of explaining an algorithm. So when you see AlphaGo, it has very little to do on this side. It has very much to do about pushing this as far as possible so that you make the knowledge that you need to be able to play Go absolutely trivial, right? And it's very cool because we can use enormous amount of data, but the narrative is often played that we've learned something intelligent. And that, to me, I think is bullshit, right? It's not. Right? It's a very fast librarian with access to an enormous amount of data. Cool. So, if you then agree with me that the key concept that we needed in order to differentiate between different models, as you just did, or different explanations, is that we need to add this concept of knowledge. Right? 
So let's then go back and think about how can we add knowledge to a machine learning system. So if you open any machine learning book that has a bit of statistical learning theory in it, or you pick Shah Ben Davis book on machine learning, which will start on this, you will see this equation. If you haven't seen this, let's just, uh, I'll go through it very quickly. So this is how you can abstract any learning method. So the notion is that I have a hypothesis class of possible solution, H. I have a finite training set. So this is my training data. And I have some learning algorithm. And what I'm interested in doing, and I have a loss function, which is, uh, let's see if this is, yeah, I have a loss function here. So what I want to do when I do machine learning is I want to somehow, should be min, I want to minimize the average loss of something. So what I want to do is I want to take my algorithm. The algorithm is something that helps me traverse the parameterization of my hypothesis space. Okay? Then I apply that algorithm in that hypothesis space with some data, and that will return a single hypothesis. And now I want to find the one that is on average best. Right? Now, the problem is I do not have access to the distribution of the data. If I have that, there's nothing to learn. Job done. So what we always do is that we make this very, very big and broad assumption is that we said, well, I have some training data, though. What I'm going to do is going to pick the thing that's on be average best on the training data. This approximation here is all we deal with, right? And now you can see that thing there does not solve the curve fitting problem I had here, right? It does not. So how do we then deal with the stuff that makes sense in between? Well, that is when we then add knowledge to any system. The reason why I wanted to do learning theory was because these here are the three parts where I can add knowledge to a machine learning system. So I like then to think about First thing you can do is adding knowledge to the algorithm that traverses your hypothesis space. Because you remember, it's all about including bias to find certain things and not find other things. So to me, this is a little bit like, cool, I don't want those explanations. So I'll put an eye patch on here. Right now, I don't see them, so I don't walk there. Then I've decided, well, actually, I like in my parameter space solutions that if one is good, the near one should also be quite good. So I put on very big clown shoes, stochastic gradient descent, and then I make sure that I don't fall into these. And then I come up with other types of mechanisms. So eventually I'm a bit, little bit like John Cleese in the Ministry of Silly Walks, right? But this is one way of including bias to your search. And this is really why neural networks work, right? This is exactly the way that we include a bias to them very often, right? And there's more to it, but that is the hint. So the next thing, which we saw a lot of the first day, I believe, and Amanda talked about it, was to say, well, I can also bias my data set. So if I know I have all the red data points, but I know there's a multi-modality, some symmetry going on, I can just generate the rest and I can train on that. Fine. Now you say, I also need to do this on that. Cool. You're reducing your, you're including knowledge the whole time. Or it is the final step, which is the weird chicken and an egg problem. And that is to say something about the hypothesis space itself. Right? So now you're saying, okay, what I want to do is that I want to encode a preference directly on the solution space itself, right? And that's what I'm going to try and talk about. And this is really what you've seen a lot as well. I just like when it's a summer school and it's the last day, we're all a bit tired. It could be kind of nice to hear something over and over again from a slightly different perspective. Cool. So there's two questions that then rises. So we first said we need knowledge. Now we have the three knobs and dials that we can input knowledge in. So the first question we need to somehow think about is how do we parameterize knowledge? And I think this will be hard, even though at one point in time there were people talking about fussy logic and all sorts of strange things, but 
they're you know they're in some basement now so there, there's really nothing else than talking about probabilities as quantifications of beliefs but we've kind of settled on that come up with something new would be great but we're not going to really talk too much about that so what we do is we quantify our knowledge with probability distributions so then the next thing will be then how do we now if i have my data i got my quantification of knowledge in terms of distribution how do i now merge them two together and this is where this debate which i think is a little bit of a silly debate but it has come up several times during lunch that i've had with nice people about what does it mean to be Bayesian? And Carl's talked about it, Subin's talked about it, and I'm going to give my flavor on it because I think, I hope I can point out the one thing that you have to think about if you agree or not. Don't make it a religious big thing, it's not, right? So if we think about base rule, the most interesting object is this. The denominator in this is the thing that's really interesting because the process of how we get to it is the interesting thing. So that's the concept of marginalization. And this is where you agree or don't agree by being Bayesian. Does it make sense to average my beliefs? If that's true or not, that's the question you have to ask yourself. So then let's look at these two things in here. So we first have the likelihood term. So the likelihood term is the thing that tells me if I have a instantiation of a world, so theta is equal to theta one, how would that world manifest itself? And then I can evaluate, I can measure how well that fits my data. Okay, so that's effectively your parameterization of the world. That has a huge effect depend on, as we'll see, it has a huge effect how we parameterize the world, right? Then you have the next thing, which is effectively your prior, right? I like to think about this as a measure, right? And I like to think about it as a measure that has been transformed. So the way I want to think about this is this, see if you follow now. So I think about P of theta, D theta as one thing. So I like to rewrite that, as, and if there's a pure mathematician who works in measure theory, I'm sure I'm doing every possible error there is. But I like to think about this as a transformation of my parameter space, right? That's how I think about this measure thing here. So my prior is the thing that transforms my parameterization of the, or my parameterization of the problem according to my beliefs. So, one way of seeing this is just, this is how we do sampling, right? So sorry that it's X and Y here, it should be theta and the transformed version. So I have, through my likelihood function or my model, I've defined up the parameterization of the world, a generative model. So I say now, these are the worlds I believe in more than others. Now I have this complicated structure here. When I do P theta, D theta, I transform this so that I instead look at this side. So what that prior does, it shrinks and compresses the part of the space that I think is relevant. And now I do learning in that space, right? So that's how I get the distribution of the data reflecting my beliefs. So what I, another way I think about this is that this is what gives you the basis or the reference for whatever you learn. Right? Depending on how you alter this, dependent on your prior, you're going to have a different reference or a basis of explaining your solution. So now if we just look at that as an example, so here I've just taken an example that we'll do several times, and this is the same thing that Carl did. I just have a line that only has one parameter, so I can only alter its slope. So I've got this. There's some likelihood. In this case here, I've initiated, I've instantiated the belief of the world. Now I have this thing, my prior belief, three different ones that now re-parameterizes this space through the integration. And then I get back three distributions of how I think likely worlds would look like, right? Cool?
So that's effectively how this notion looks like. And I think now the argument that you should put yourself on if you want to be Bayesian or non-Bayesian or whatever that whole thing means, is just, do you agree with the concept of averaging these things? Is that the way to accumulate, to integrate knowledge? Well, it's kind of in the word. It's, so, it's hard to even explain it without integration. So one thing though, a caveat that I wanted to bring up. So can you do everything with your prior? No. You can't, because the parameterization of the hypothesis space matters hell of a lot as well. And this is a very good example of this, because this parameter space on the weight or the slope of this line is already transformed, if you want it, from the canonical representation that we think of. There's a lot more part of the parameter space that deals with these lines that have a very high slope, the one that's plus 500 million and the one that's plus 700,000 million, they are basically the same line, but they're super far in parameter space. They're going to all generate very, very similar, simple, similar distributions over here. So just the caveat that you always need to think about is not only the prior that implies the transformation, it's also the model, right? So just in this case, I've taken something that you could very easily reason about. This is the most uncertain prior I have, but actually it leads to, I really believe in very, very few models, types of lines using the yellow one. Just simply because the parameterization of the model itself. Cool. So I'm gonna skip these very quickly. So, I'm going to now, this was my roundup of random IDs that I thought I wanted to go through after hearing the people talk during the week. So one thing then, what I wanted to highlight with these issues or these just actually showing what marginalization actually does to something is that you'll often hear things like this. Bayesian inference will automatically perform model selection and choose the simplest possible explanation that is consistent with observed data. Well, there's word highlighted there. What the hell do you mean with simple, right? Simple is something that has to define, go back to the flat earth or the spherical earth. They both work according to Occam's razor. I've talked to them, right? It's just that our notion of simple is very, very, very different, right? So the notion of simple is a relative concept. And there's an absolutely beautiful paper or it's a tech report by Ian Murray uh, from 2005, which is called something, no, you all see there, there's references in there later, but, but it's called something Notes on Occam's Razor and Evidence or something like this. It's a beautiful paper that really highlights these things with tic-tac-toe games. It's really, really nice, right? So, well, that means, so how do we encode when we think about Bayesian models, the notion of simplicity. Well, the notion of simplicity is encoded both in my parameterization of the model, as I said, and the prior that we used it. Those two combinations will jointly define a concept of simple. So what that means is that when we pick solutions that are supposedly more simple, we always have to think about that the solution of any algorithm can only be interpreted relative to the knowledge that it refers to. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything, right? So if you want to go down the Bayesian route of thinking about that, the posterior distribution can only ever be interpreted in light of the prior. And if I ever see a paper again that has uncertainty plots of some data, and I'm supposed to say they're good or not, independent of showing me what the prior is, ugh, I don't know. Well, I don't know what you know. So how am I supposed to know what, your, what the data taught you? It doesn't mean anything, right? Cool. So what do we then look for in a good parameterization of a model? So we are looking for things that are flexible in the way that we don't have to make trade-offs when we include our beliefs. So what that means is that I want a parameterization which says, I like this, I like this, I don't like this. Then I shouldn't have to say, well, in order to like both of them, I have to include all of it, right? That's what I mean with flexible, okay? 
We want the model, and this is kind of the same thing, to be allowed to be very, very narrow. So we want to include as much knowledge as humanly possible so that we can reduce data requirements. That's always the case. And any interest in machine learning problem have very small amounts of data. Still haven't found an interesting big data problem. Still looking. Yeah? And we want, this is part of the same thing again, we want things to be interpretable in such a way that we can translate the domain knowledge that we have to the parameters, to the parameterization. If we can get all these things, then we can start doing interesting machine learning. So what am I going to do now? So bloody hell, I've talked a long time. So what we're going to do now is that I'm going to try and convince you in the third part of an interesting way that addresses some of these issues. And that's thinking about non-parametric representations of models. I will show you how we can build statistical models over those. And in specific, I'll make a completely different introduction to Gaussian processes. And then in part two, we will then take this a step further and we'll do a little bit of a whirlwind tour and look at actually the concept of statistical inference is much bigger than just thinking about learning the distribution of data. It can be used for tons of things. It can be used as a thinking of how I used to reason about unknown things, right? And we will do that by looking at computations. Cool. So let's then talk about non-parametric models. So as I said, there'll be a little bit more bikes. So the bike rule here was drink triples, don't ride triples, right? And it's about the intimate relationship between beer and cycling. So my example of a non-parametric model is going to take beer into account. So I like beer, and especially these days when it's very warm outside. So now, it turns out I had a really nice beer yesterday. And now I want to explain to you guys how nice that was, right? And how that tasted so you can have the same beer. Now, a parametric explanation of that would be, cool, here's the recipe for the beer. These are all the components. This, I've abstracted the beer to use this thing. How many of you, there might be some, like Vincent is from Belgium. They probably do this in first grade in school. But for most other people, we would have no idea about this, right? So the parametric explanation is kind of useless, right? So the other way of thinking about it is that well, if you have one beer, you never really, you don't really stop, right? You have a few more. So you have a database of beers that you had. And now what's even better is that you and I have had some beers together. So what I'll do when I come to Miguel and say, oh, you know, you have to go to the Cambridge Blue tomorrow because they have on tap this thing that's like, you know, that Kiwi ipa we had with that really hoppy head but the body was like that yorkshire bitter it's like wow it's fantastic right what i provided now was an explanation of something new in relation to what i previously known right so that's effectively what a non-parametric model does right the easiest example of this is clearly something like a nearest neighbor right so if we think about it like this it's saying Cool, this is my first beer. I've never had beer before. So, <laughs> well, then everyone thinks it's disgusting. But, but, you know, I've never had beer before, so I don't know anything. But as soon as I start getting some, you know, this is my second beer now. Now I can relate these two together. And the more of them I drink, well, now I can come up with new concepts of relating them to each other. I, instead of thinking about how do I structure this space of beer, how do I parameterize flavors in this space, I instead say, oh, I parameterize how I relate things to each other with some form of measure. It could be I've just picked the nearest neighbor. It could be I pick some distance. I can pick some really weird distance like this. But the only thing I'm doing is that I'm relating data points to each other. Right? So now this is not a model. There's no probabilities. There's nothing modeling about this, right? It's just a statement of representation. So what we want to do now is that we want to see how can I think about these parameterizations as statistical models? So we're going to do that 
by now talking about non parametric models. So, in specific, we are going to talk about functions, right? So, here we got this plane. And what we want to do is that we want to define now a distribution over functions. So, this feels really weird because we're so tuned of thinking about parameterizations here, right? So, instead, we should think about what is a function. And Carl had hinted at this yesterday of thinking about what is a function well it's a relationship between an input and an output so what i can do i can start off with saying this if i take a slice from plus infinity to minus infinity here what i know about every function is this is going to cut this line once and only once right that's a characteristic that i know of the function so what i can now say is that I can specify a belief over where I think that intersection point is. So we're going to specify that as a Gaussian, right? Now, there's nothing special about three, so I can do the same argument at minus two, right? So now I've just made two slices, and I say, somehow I believe that the function is going to cut according to this probability distribution. So what effectively I've done is that I've specified two function values as two Gaussians, right? So now that's not particularly interesting because the thing we want to know about functions, the next characteristics, is that there should be some form of dependency between points, right? So we can look at that and think, I now gave you what the function value were at minus two. And now we can ask ourselves the question, how does that relate? What does that say about this? It's the same thing, the same question as I just had this beer. How does that relate to the previous ones I had? Right? It's exactly the same question. So you could either say, well, knowing this one doesn't change my understanding of this one at all. Or you can say, well, knowing this one, it really says a lot. And it says that it should just copy its value, it's just the same or it's somewhere in between, right? Now, this we can very easily parameterize, right? Because what we do is that we now say that these two slices are not independent Gaussians, but they're jointly Gaussian. And now, the structure of that distribution that we had in red is completely parameterized by the covariance between these two slices, right? That's the measure that we have to include how the function should vary. Okay, so just some examples of this, right? If you're saying, well, if I make them independent, all conditionals look the same. If I make them massively dependent, well, now these conditionals basically just copy the value, right? So what we can then do is that we can now think about our two slices and we can specify the specific Gaussian this two-dimensional Gaussian, and then we can draw some samples from that. So I draw this sample, and then I connect these two with a line. I can draw a couple of more, and I see this, right? Or I can change this Gaussian and make the covariance much bigger, so which means that the two slices covary a lot more, and now I get something like this, right? Now everything will be much, much flatter, right? And this all comes down from just the parameterization of this covariance object. Cool, and independent. So now, two slices aren't particularly interesting. We talked about the real benefit of thinking non-parametrically is that you have this expansion. The more beer you drink, the more you understand about beer, right? So we want to get that characteristic in as well. Well, there's nothing special about these two slices. Well, I can make a third, make a fourth, or I can make tons of them, right? So now what I can do, I can just formulate this massive multivariate Gaussian instead, which has n slices, where n is very, very big. Now comes a property of Gaussians that Carl hinted to, which is the really, really cool and key thing about it. And that is the marginal property or the consistent property of a Gaussian. So now let's say I have this two-dimensional Gaussian and I want to pick out the marginal distribution. So I just want to look at the function values of one slice. Cool. So I integrate that out 
it is this, right? You haven't proven this to yourself. It's quite nice to do, even though we all know it. Now, instead, I take this n-dimensional Gaussian, and I want to pick these marginals out. Well, it's exactly the same thing, right? That's a really, really useful property, because what that means is that we can now think about, let's skip that, we can now think about this Gaussian as actually an infinite dimensional Gaussian. It's an infinite dimensional multivariate Gaussian, but what I know is that any marginals that I look at it are consistent. And this here is what's called the marginal property, sometimes referred as consistency. And what it means, what it really says is this. And it's one of the two properties of Kolmogorov's extension or existence theorem, which is what defines which stochastic processes exist. So it says for all measurable sets and probability measure, uh, the probability measure that we have is a Gaussian, it says this. Basically, if I just expand here, it doesn't change those marginals. So what that means is that I can effectively think about the two slices that we took as coming from an underlying infinite Gaussian. And that allows us to draw samples like this. So in this case, I draw this two-dimensional sample. Cool, it's just a line. But actually, I now look at three marginals instead. Well, now it's that. Now I look at five marginals. Well, it's that. I'm just drawing lines between them. And now I look at whatever, five. I split them more, nine marginals. Dunk. Now I have something that's starting to look a lot like a smooth function, right? And the only thing was that these two first marginals have a massive Gaussian. Now it's decided which marginals I decided to pick out. Now to get one of them, I have to fix the random seed so I can draw more random samples and I can do it like this instead, right? That is exactly the same thing where I look at more and more marginals. So effectively, what I can think about through this property is that I can think about the notion of these slices as being this infinite Gaussian tube instead. But what I know is that as soon as I work with the marginals, they are always consistent with this infinite object that sits on top. So one way then to think about the Gaussian, this is how I like to think about it, is that there exists a Gaussian process, this infinite dimensional object that I can never ever touch and never do anything with. Now there is a projection, an axis aligned projection that just picks out certain ones of them from infinity to however much I look at, and that is a Gaussian distribution. That's a multivariate Gaussian. And that means I can do all my work with you simple, beautiful linear algebra on Gaussians, but I know there is a beautiful story about this actually being about functions, right? If you just want to code them and work with them, well, you just work here and you don't care about that, right? Cool. So we've already seen the definition. So then then comes in, now we've kind of introduced these and hopefully you get, you agree with me that it seems like a sensible thing to do. Now comes back to what I talked about parameterization, because my aim is here that I'm going to try and convince you that this is a really good parameterization of a problem and something that allows me to put priors in to put very narrow structures and all those things that I said that I want from a good parameterization. So how do we control them? What are the parameters of this object? And this is really this measure, these two, so one of them is basically saying something about the mean. So this is parameterizing how the mean, and the other one saying how these slices co-vary, right? And this here is now a function of this index set. It's a measure on this index set that has to have some properties. It has to have properties that it val generates a valid Gaussian, but you have an enormous amount of flexibility on this. This is your handle on a Gaussian process. So we parameterize this covariance function as a function of the input. So now the index set is the uncountable infinity in this case, because it's, it's um, the real line or plane. And now this is, as I said, this is your handle where you can input knowledge into this thing. 
and you specify basically your degree of how does two slices co-vary related to how I index them. And that's it. If this parameterization aligns well with the domain knowledge that you have, which I often think it does, right? it's much easier when you go out and work. I work in medical domains, for example, or pharmaceuticals. You can, it's much easier to ask the question, is that similar to that? Then say, can you explain to me this and that in two sets of parameters and give me a measure between those parameters? This is a much, much easier notion, right? This is something where you can often get this type of knowledge because you can give relative experiments, right? Cool. So just hints of what you can do, right? So far, we've just seen these smooth things. It's very easy. Now you just have an exponent, in this case, just a fall off with distance, so these are those non-stationary functions that Carl talked about. Well, now you're going to draw samples that look like this, or you can also do things like, you know, here we've got some periodicity, very easy. You've got a lot of flexibility to design these things. And if your domain knowledge aligns well with this, these are great models to use. Non-parametrics are fantastic models in that case. Cool. So, uh, I'm just going to briefly talk about this so that we can get on to the good stuff in a bit. So, nice thing about this is this is going to be very short because there's not much to it. So, what we want to do, if we then want to do inference in a Gaussian process, is that we want to say I have some, I've seen some data points, and now I want to predict over some others, right? So, we want to do this base rule. Okay. Now, that integral that I said looks absolutely horrible in most cases. It's extremely horrible in this case, if you don't think about it, because what it's effectively saying is that I have this measure on functions, which is my Gaussian process, and I want to reparameterize the whole function space based on every of those, right? So I effectively have. In this case, I have to compute, I have to sum this over every possible function. This seems horrible. However, so another way of thinking about it is this slide. So I have my prior, this is my prior sample. So now I've seen a data point. I want to build an if statement where I put every point and test if it goes through this. If it does not, I give them zero probability. And I basically make them disappear in that transformation. Right? Okay, you don't want to write that if statement, but it turns out that this is, of course, trivial to do, simply because of the marginal property that we have again. So, what we do know is that we've defined a Gaussian process, which means we've defined the joint distribution of everything. Then, we know that the marginal property that the Gaussian is consistent. So, therefore, if I look at this one, it's also going to be a Gaussian. So now I have two of those. I also know that this is Gaussian. So that means I can simply solve for this object. Now I can solve for that. It's a little bit of linear algebra, which leads us to this expression that we saw before, that we saw yesterday. So that's it. And this is really, really nice. So we're effectively avoiding computing this integral by just using the properties of the Gaussian and we have some linear algebra, and poof, we've got this beautiful, simple thing to do, right? Cool. So with that, you can now do things like this, right? Which is actually very, very cool, <laughs> if you think about it. I'm effectively seeing some data. I'm taking a process that contains every function, and now I'm conditioning up on a set of data and giving zero probability in my new representation to stuff that doesn't go through this data. I find that. Fantastic. Cool. So I am going to skip this slide because we're going to get to that later on. I'm going to just summarize uh, this first bit of the talk. So the first thing that I wanted to get to was just that I hoped we got from, from my silly example of the flat earth was that in order to learn something, you have to include a bias in one way or the other. Okay, we can know this, that's what the free, no free lunch tells us. But what you also then have to think about 
is that any explanation of the results that you have can only ever be interpreted relative to what you put in, right? It has to be interpreted in that way. So arguing religiously about being Bayesian or not boils down to me if you agree with the process of marginalization. And I think possibly you can be pragmatically non-Bayesian, but I find it very, very hard to not be it philosophically. I still haven't heard a single argument that makes sense. Anything you tell me, I can formulate as a conditional probability and we win, right? That is how it is. So, <laughs> but I can see it pragmatically simply because you're saying, well, you do all this thing, nice stuff that you can't compute. So it doesn't actually matter, right? That argument I can buy, right? That's a different thing. So then non-parametrics, which is this notion of having infinite capacity by parameterizing a model through the relationship of data. This is good because of two ways, right? It's good because one, I think this is something we can much more commonly get knowledge about in domains than about parameterized, parameterized models. I would really like to see a photographer give nice priors to Zubin's model with 540 billion parameters. I, I would just like to see that person who writes them down, right? No, it doesn't make sense at all, right? But this, in a non-parametric model, it starts making sense, right? So then if you want to build models of these, it leads to stochastic processes. I only talked about Gaussian processes now. There are more of them. And uh, Gaussian processes then are used really simple, practically. It's a simple manipulation with multivariate normals. But the cool thing is that there's this really beautiful semantic in terms of stochastic processes. And what I find really cool about this is then you then, having this allows you to talk to physicists, to people who work in control and so forth, because they look at exactly the same problem, exactly the same tools, but used from different angles. But they just have a completely different narrative about them. But if we just spend our time hacking it out in this way with multivariate normals, we're losing that angle. So, a question I often get when I introduce Gaussian processes is that, cool, so is there a process for every distribution? And there is this then, we've talked about just the marginal property of this, but this is Kolmogorov's extension or existence theorem, which says that any finite probability measure that obeys these two points is a realization of an underlying stochastic process, right? And this have turned out that it can be a really, really useful thing. Uh, cool. So then let's go back where I tried to convince you that I said, which I don't think I've done properly yet, the Gaussian processes are good parameterizations of a problem. Maybe I've convinced you, maybe not. So when you see that image, what do you think about? Do you think, wow, this is a really, flexible model, it looks like it contains lots of different functions. Or do you think this is a really, really narrow probability distribution because all those functions look exactly the same. So very often, I think people see this plot and they think, wow, what a diversity of functions. That's because you're stuck in a parametric way of thinking about these. If you would have to write up the parameterization of something that looks like this, you would have tons of weird things, right? If you think about it non-parametrically, these are all exactly the same. And this is the cool thing with the Gaussian process. The Gaussian process is so damn tiny, narrow, nothing, right? The amount of entropy that exists in this thing when you get to really high dimensional things is nothing, right? The volume of that Gaussian in that huge space is very little. And this is the benefit of these things. And that's why they can learn from small amounts of data. The only reason you can ever learn from small amounts of data is if you have an enormous bias. And GPs allows us to put insane amounts of bias on these things in a very, very nice way. And they allow us to put good bias because the bias that we often want so that we don't have to, I want this and I want this, but I don't want this shit, I have to include both, right? That's often a thing that I think why they're useful. 
So then, before I finish, I have to address the pink elephant in the room. So the pink elephant in the room is that this, right? Okay, I haven't come to my pet hates yet, but you'll eventually come to them in my next session. There's a slide called rants, but I'm going to have a small rant now. First, I hate the word deep learning. Why add the notion of deep when mathematicians call these composite functions? That's what you're doing. Just call it what it is, right? The deep applies all sorts of things. He's a deep thinker, blah, right? Nonsense. It's composite functions and you're learning them, right? The end. So, apparently, there's all these benefits of doing composite functions. Well, there is, if we think about algorithmic knowledge, as I said, it turns out, we've shown so much evidence of this, that with the optimizers that we have, these parameterizations are really, really simple to find stuff in, to add this bias in. Great, fine, absolutely. So now, how about then getting the best of both worlds, right? We can do both. This is amazing, right? Let's make deep Gaussian processes. So now, this is a plot that I generated myself, and it's a very good friend of mine that generated it first, who wrote the deep DP paper, Andreas Damiano. And in that paper, they say, cool, I have a step function. This function is not differentiable once. Now, a GP can't learn that. Well, of course it can, if you put the right priors in. But what they said then, let's do a deep GP on this. And especially what we'll do, we'll put the deep GP where each layer is an RBF kernel. So each layer is something that's infinitely differentiable. So you place a prior on learning infinitely differentiable functions, aiming to learn something that's not differentiable once, right? You see how wrong this is, right? Now you get this fit out that looks like this, and you might say this is really good, right? Well, as I said before, I can't say if this is good because I have no idea what they put in. I don't understand what happens when you put 10 smooth functions to each other. Right? It's weird. I, I can't organize my head that way. So I can't say if this is good, but apparently this is a realization of this. Okay, so next pet hate, these plots. The people in the GP community do these plots all the time, and they look at them and they think they're great. What that is, is that you learn a covariance matrix, right? You pick out the marginals that you want to predict over, you have a massive covariance matrix. That's a diagonal of the covariance matrix. But you've learned a whole matrix. Why do you show the diagonal? So how do you show the whole matrix? Well, you plot samples. Dunk. That samples from a deep GP that learns a step function. Right? It's not that where you might think, oh, I've got nice wiggly functions through here. No, it's this thing that's reparameterized the space. So the only two things that exist in this parameterization is minus one and one. And then it jumps between them. It jumps a little bit less here. Here it jumps 50-50 all the time. Now that is a completely different explanation of this, right? So when you've learned these very nice functions, models, don't show that plot. Or this plot, show that plot. Okay? So composite GPs are potentially interesting, but inference is a huge issue. So now then comes the thing of Bayesian neural networks, and I'm just going to have my opinion here, because I like to, you know, we should have controversy. We are wine in the afternoon. To me, a Bayesian neural network is the worst of both worlds. What the hell is the point? You have a prior that you do not understand in a structure that you do not get, which means to me we're effectively spending a huge amount of computational overload to implement a regularizer just to be able to put this in a narrative of somehow being Bayesian, right? If I don't get what I put in, I can definitely not say anything what I get out, right? Maybe that's just me not being clever enough, but at least to me, that's what it is. So when should you just use a composite model at all? To me, you should use a composite no model when your knowledge is composite and never else. Then you should work on a model that you understand. So I'll give a few examples of this. So this to me is reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is a composite model. So what I have is that I have a policy, I have a dynamic model and I have some state. I have a model 
that says, given my policy and where I currently am, I should do this action. Then I put that action in, in my current state, I take the dynamics model and I see where I end up next. That's a rollout in the reinforcement model. Now, this is composite. You have completely different knowledge about your action and you have your policy and your dynamic model. Therefore, this requires to be composite. If you blend them all together, you can't use the knowledge, right? Therefore, it's required to be composite. The other thing was an example that one of my former students worked on was looking at wind farms. This is exactly the same thing where I have, I know how things interact. I know how each of these entities are rather than looking at this as predict energy from wind farm. What I can do is that I know a lot about these because they were built by German engineers. They know everything. And then I know a lot of physics of how fast wind travels. Now I can decompose these things to each other, exploit that knowledge and learn something, right? That's a useful thing. And then my final then, this ended up being a rant deal, that's fine. Then I wanted to hint on the final thing, and this is paper, uh, Yeva, who's now looking down, she's embarrassed probably. <laughs> but this is one thing that we toyed around with. So what do you actually want from a composite model, not a composite method? So what is the promise of uncertainty in this? Well, what you also want to do, if your knowledge is composite, you also want to decompose your new knowledge compositely. So let's take a very simple example. I have this square here, and then I want to transform this to this. And I've decided I'm going to have a composite model of rotation, translation, rotation, translation to get there. There's no noise. There's no uncertainty in what I need to do. I can know exactly what I need to do. So but what I want from a composite model in this case is to decompose this uncertainty. Right? So I want to say, well, I can do all these rotations. Now, if I pick one specific rotation, that means I can do this subset of translations. If I do this subset of translations, well, in order to get there, these are the final rotation and translation I want to do. Right? This is a decomposition of uncertainty because models we build to derive knowledge, right? And this is deriving a knowledge through this parameterization. Here's an example of learning a sine wave in a composition of these functions, right? If you pick the orange, you have to pick the orange straight through, right? Now, something that isn't a model would just pick one of these here, right? And sadly, the way we build statistical composite models, because we can't do inference in them, is that they effectively lead to exactly the same thing. And that's what I kind of mean that we're spending an awful amount of computational effort for very little benefit. So with that, I am going to finish. And then next talk, we are going to talk more about how we can use these things and do some interesting inference. Cool. Thank you very much.